And welcome to Ask the Realtor on 1270 AM WCBC. Paul Mullen here along with Adam Conrad. Adam, welcome to the show again. Hey, glad to be back. Back to doing it again, yeah. Today we're going to talk about the profession a little bit, real estate, and how you get into it, what the process is to getting there and mm-hmm. doing that. Sure. So uh, I, we were talking a little bit about the show, before the show today, about the, there are two basic parts to it. There's getting licensed and then becoming an agent. Well, well, first, it's not the same thing. Well, well first let's talk about uh, you know your initial desire to get into real estate. Um, and, and so, first of all, you have to fall down and bump your head. Uh, I'm just kidding. <laughs> Before you're uh, really... Uh, now, that's what you got to do to get into radio. <laughs> oh, oh, okay. And maybe there's a similarity between these professions. So, mm-hmm. uh, so, so, once you've got it in your head, and we can talk a little bit more about that, once you've got it in your head that you want to get into the real estate business, um, you're right. There's really a fork in the. There's really two things you got to do. The first is you have to get a license, mm-hmm. uh, and so that. And I'll t- kind of talk you through, walk you down through some of the process of doing that. And uh, the audience listening probably saying, "Oh, geez, this is you know, I'm not interested in becoming an agent, so gee, this isn't for me." But you know, I, I think it's really worthwhile to really uh, give this some thought because a lot of folks really. You know, you might revisit this later. Well, and, and also, when you're doing business with somebody, if you know how they got there. You're exactly right. I think that makes you a little bit more knowledgeable from the get-go. Exactly. So so there's this piece where you got to get the license. Mm. Uh, you got to get the ticket, so to speak. And then second is you, you've got to learn the business. you got to actually be the agent. you actually got to learn that process and, and become uh, successful. Uh, one doesn't necessarily guarantee... The, the, the other. So, I mean, uh, you have to be licensed, obviously, to be an agent and be successful, but just because you have a license does not mean you're going to take off and hang the moon. Is this like medical school and residency? It could be. Yeah, it could, could be. I mean, uh, you know, I would have a very difficult time because I'm not, I can't deal with the, the blood and all that kind of yeah. stuff. Yeah. Uh, interestingly, my, my son's a physician assistant. He does surgery all day. And uh, I, I look at some of the stuff he does and some of the procedures he talks about, and I could I don't think I could ever do that, Paul. You know, really? just I just don't have the, you know, I'm just not that guy. And he doesn't seem to have any trouble, you know, uh, helping do open heart surgery. Uh, you know, me, I'm sitting there scratching my head saying, you know, I cut myself and I'm getting a little cruisy. <laughs> well, you know, I can understand his part too, you know. Yeah. And you probably have in common that you like to help people. Exactly right. And I think yeah. that that's a, the the common thread there. Yeah, I, I think we uh, we we've learned a, a lot about. Uh, it, it's just ingrained in us that we have this notion of um, of paying it forward. Uh, you know, of uh, of generosity. And I think there's a there's a real advantage. Uh, you know, something that we've always done. If you if you're generous, you know, good things typically come back to you. Um, you don't do it for that reason, but uh, you just you just like to help people. And, and give them a hand, and I think that's where uh, that type of a mentality is very helpful to have in real estate. If I see you in my operating room, though, I'm not. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I'll, I'll hand somebody an instrument, but I you know, forget about you know forget about any more than that, right? Yeah. The other my other medical rule is never trust an anesthesiologist who carries a hammer. <laughs> So, yeah, that's a good one. There you go. So, okay, we have the two tracks. Okay, so anesthesiologist and hammer. Right, right, right. right. <laughs> now you have get a license, and then you have to learn the biz. Right. So, so let's talk about getting the license piece. And this is a fairly mechanical uh, operation, and that's you're going to need uh, a certain number of hours of education, which varies a little bit by state. But you're going to need a certain number. It's typically in the sixty to ninety range uh, of hours that you're going to need in order to sit for a real estate uh, examination. To te- you know, test that you've actually learned the material. Now that's sixty to ninety hours, not related to college hours. No, no, this would be actual hour hours. Right, and you can actually locally here, you can take classes at ACM uh, to uh, to actually get you know, I'll get any College of Maryland. You can actually right. get the uh, the coursework in and learn. Um, I actually own a real estate school. It happens to be licensed in Pennsylvania, not in Maryland, so mm-hmm. we don't actually offer the classes here. Uh, but in Pennsylvania, for example, it's sixty hours, and the nice thing 
thing is, um, if you live in Pennsylvania, you can get a reciprocal license and and, and do business in Maryland. Okay. Um, and that's really no testing involved. You just literally uh, fill out a form and, and, of course, pay money. Yeah. Uh, and you can get a license, a reciprocal license. Um, and I think the same is true in Maryland. So if you have a Maryland license, and it, it comes down to your residency. So you can't take a Pennsylvania license if you live in Maryland. Uh, you got to get the Maryland license, and then you can get the reciprocal one. What are the differences between the states and what you would learn or have to learn? You know, really, Paul, it's it's literally identical, um, the information you need to learn. That's one of the reasons there's a reciprocity between the states. Uh, there's, you know, there's some nuances in terms of some of the homestead exemptions and things like that. But for the most part, the material you learn in real estate class is really centered around law, Fair and fair housing uh, are two really important pieces that they're looking uh, for you to understand. Um, know the licensing law. Know when you need a license to perform what types of things, and uh, how to stay, uh, you know, true and uh, and not run afoul of uh, any uh, fair housing laws. Um, so that's so the the key there is really understanding those pieces and not really much about the practice of real estate. So the actual day-to-day, you know, when when you take the courses, a lot of people say, great, I'm going to go learn to be a real estate agent. You're really not going to learn how to be a real estate agent. You're going to learn the things you need to pass the test that's testing your knowledge of the law and the fair housing and things like that. Okay. So you pass the class. Yes. Then what do you do? You, you, you test. Get, yeah, you got to take the test you, and, yeah, and, you, and, and, and get, uh, get a good score and pass. What, what's passing? Uh, I think 80? it's like 75, a lot of states it's 75 or 80% to mm-hmm. pass. And uh, so once you pass, uh, then, and, and by the way, once you pass, nobody knows you got the low score or the high score. Right. It's, you pass. Uh, so once you pass, uh, most states work that you now have to work as an agent for a broker. So now you need to find you a broker to be able to hang your license. They call it hanging the license. So it's mm-hmm. you got to be able to uh, put your license with a broker somewhere. So that's that could be an interview process where you go out and talk to a number of different brokers and say, well, you know, why should I go here versus go there? And, okay. and I recommend that. If you, uh, you, you really need, of course, this is like, uh, isn't this a lot like the uh, interviewing listing agents? You know, yeah. most people interview just one. Do, do you want to work for a friend, or would you rather work for somebody that might be a little tough on you at the beginning? Well, I think there's. Uh, you might be heading towards a discussion of wouldn't it be better to have a coach? Mm-hmm. Uh, and I think uh, you know Tiger Woods has a coach. Mm-hmm. He has a swing coach. He has you know he has a putting coach. He has somebody who coaches him, and he's at the top levels. I mean, arguably at the top levels of the game. Right? Not anymore. Yeah, yeah, yeah not a bad coach now. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> but but yeah. you get you get the idea is right. that you know if you're in professional sports. Right. You still have a coach, mm-hmm. and I think the the same is true for real estate. You know, you need a coach, you need a mentor, you need somebody who's going to get you from point A to point B. Um, many brokers focus on hiring experienced agents that have been around for a long time. They want to gather up you know people that are experienced, and uh, you know, so they're they're playing it on a different you know they're playing. I want to say they're playing at a different mm-hmm. level, but they're they're emphasis is different. Um, We spend a lot of time at Perry Wellington incubating and training and mentoring agents. Um, we, We have a school in Pennsylvania, for example, and we bring people up through the school and we actually teach them real estate uh, for for the purpose of getting a license, and then we teach them the business of being an agent so that they can be successful in their careers. Okay. Uh, What would you learn from the agent that you wouldn't learn from the technical end? The personality part, the uh, uh, well, people skills, the, uh, the the technical part of getting the license is is really doesn't really have any sales in, involved in it. It doesn't teach you anything about how to sell real estate. It, mm-hmm. it teaches you what to watch out for if you're in a transaction, right? But it doesn't teach you how to get into that transaction in the first place. So uh, there's nothing in the the real estate course uh, to get your license that teaches you how to prospect for new clients. Uh, it doesn't teach you how to work with uh, hysterical buyers who are afraid that they're going to be homeless. <laughs> it doesn't teach you how to write up a sales contract. I mean, to some degree, it'll teach a little bit about that, but it doesn't teach you how to advocate for your client, so to speak, and help you write a contract that's most advantageous to your client. Uh, it doesn't teach you how to, you know, prospect for listings to figure out, you know, who's going to be listing their home and and uh, going through the process of winning a listing appointment, for example. Sounds like you need to be a part-time psychologist in this in this business. Am I reading that wrong? You know, it's. Uh, y- y- 
you have to be empathetic is very important. And you, so you I've joked for a while. We, we had an office in our first, where we first opened up um, uh, Perry Wellington. We were actually running space in a building that had a bunch of uh, psychologists in the building. Oh. <laughs> which was really, uh, really ironic because uh, I would speak to, uh, we had some of them, some of them were clients of ours who would buy and sell homes. But I spoke to one of the, uh, psych- actually a psychiatrist, and I said to him, I said, you know, maybe you ought to buy some time. Uh, you can come in and spend time with the agents and with our clients uh, every week. He said, you know, he said, one of the things to keep, it, and this stuck with me, he said, one of the things to keep in mind, and maybe the reason there's so much uh, uh, psychology to the business or so much emotion to the business, he said, is that uh, people have a sense of security. He said, and, and their sense of security is often, he said, and, and not rightly so, he said, but often uh, it, it sunk into their, their investment in a home. He said, so they, you know, they, they're essentially what we'll call a false sense of security is in home ownership. Mm-hmm. He said, and so he said, when they uh, unhinge that and start to look for a new home or have sold that home, he said, that sense of security is now in question. Hmm. He said, so as a result of that, he said, you, you're going to deal with a lot of people who are going to be very skittish mm-hmm. and very emotional because a lot of their their sa- safety and security is wrapped up in home ownership. And I'd never thought of it quite that way. And I think there's a takeaway from that. And that's the, to be very, tread lightly, you know, because this is a very emotional time for a lot of folks. Well, your home is your psychological fort. Ex- yeah, exactly right. Yeah. And, mm-hmm. and I hadn't really thought of it in those terms, but when he pointed out, because he deals with people every day, um, and I thought that was really an interesting point of view, he said, uh, he said you're going to be dealing with a lot of emotional people. And he said, and this is critical, he said, your people have to be emotionally grounded. Mm-hmm. He said, because if not, your clients are going to rub that uh, rub off that emotional Act, you know, all of their emotion is going to rub right off on your agents, and they're going to be in for a roller coaster ride. A lot of times in high school, you'll see, uh, and, and I, I am involved in basketball on mm. the college level, but you will see the players of a team reflect the emotion of the coach. Yeah, yeah, I can see that. And, uh, you know, so I would imagine that works also in the real estate end because if you don't have a steady hand there, right. and somebody starts going off, then the steady hand supposedly starts going off, then right. everything falls off. <laughs> uh, it, it can be very, and then, you know, keep in mind that that becomes interpersonal. Mm-hmm. It's not just, you know, their relationship with the client. It becomes with other agents. Uh, so you, you, there's no lack of, um, when I talked to Debbie Grimm, who's uh, been in this business for 30 years, who runs our uh, office here in, in Maryland, in Cumberland, you know, she's got lots of stories uh, where, you know, that she goes through that all the time. When we talk about real estate and maybe that's not the only thing you do. Maybe it, you know, we, we were talking about the psychologist maybe mm. coming up and, and getting involved with a client or so. Well, that doesn't really happen that way with psychologists, but there have to be other occupations that work well with becoming a realtor. Uh, what, what do you find? Yeah, you know, I think, uh, interestingly, uh, one group of people that seems to do exceptionally well with uh, real estate are teachers. Uh, teachers, because they're dealing with uh, interacting with students, with the public, parents, um, I think teachers have been uh, really, really helpful. Um, we've got uh, radio and TV personalities involved in real estate. Oh, really? Imagine that, Paul. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah. Okay. So we've we'll got a, uh, like we call her Mystery Shadow Girl, but we got a gal that uh, host, used to host our TV show for uh, TV10 in, out of Altoona, and uh, she came on as an agent. Uh, and, and so we, she's not allowed to host our show any longer, but, uh, as a result, because of some sort of conflict, but, uh, or notion of a conflict, but yeah, there, there's, uh, public service people. We've got police officers, firemen, uh, you know, th- that have done exceptionally well with us. Uh, we've got contractors. I'm trying to think of all the different types of people we've got, uh, in the business. We've got nurses. Nurses are really good. Is Yeah, and they listen to people. Everybody that you talked about there, every occupation has to have an ear, mm-hmm. or else they're not good at that job. Right. 
uh, yeah, so it's just, a, it's a really incredible that the different walks of life uh, that we get. And, and at Perry Wellington, we work with a lot of agents who start out part-time uh, because they're looking to get their, their career ramped up in real estate. So it's interesting, um, you know, the people, uh, and I've seen this a lot too, it, retail people, folks that have worked retail tend to do really well. Uh, the folks that haven't melted down in retail and left retail, but rather have succeeded in retail. Um, matter of fact, I was talking with a broker a buddy of mine, and I, I'd never asked him what he did before real estate. Uh, what, was, what was life like before real estate, so to speak? And uh, he, he was actually a, a manager. He actually managed Walmart stores hmm. and uh, was a regional manager for Walmart before he uh, jumped into uh, the real estate business. What? Who wouldn't be good? I, I tell you who seems to be, and this will seem a little surprising. Um, I think we've seen challenges with with people who come from hourly uh, wage earner, you know, punch the time clock positions. Now, this will seem like a little bit odd to say this, but if you're used to a steady every two week paycheck, and you're used to every time you doing you're, you do something, you kind of punch in, punch out, and you get paid when you do a job. Real estate's not that. No. So, so I've seen people get frustrated because they're used to doing this for that. And in real estate, you do a lot of this, 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 and then sometimes there's a that. <laughs> uh, and so y- y- it becomes very challenging for folks that are used to kind of a transactional relationships, uh, you know, transactional job type of activity. This isn't that. It, you really have to be willing to pay it forward um, and, and realize your paydays in the future. And, and also, sometimes you're hot and sometimes you're cold. Absolutely. It, it doesn't make any difference what your approach is. Sometimes... What you're working with is not going to work out. Yeah, and, and I've seen this with agents, and I don't mean I don't mean to paint with too broad of a brush here. I don't want you know somebody to call me up and say, "Hey, that's you know that's uh, this is me," and I don't know why you're saying this, but I, I think what happens a lot of times is folks who have a mentality that I got to get paid for every little thing I do. Um, it that hurts them in activity because everything they go to do, they're looking for. Well, how is this going to mean a payday for me? And I think. When you're an agent and you understand the notion of agency is you are the client, you represent them, that you're doing everything in your power to get the good result for them. And sometimes that means you're going to do a lot of things that don't mean a payday today or tomorrow, uh, but it is the right thing to do. And if you have that type of a mentality, then you'll be terribly successful. You know, that you're doing the right thing and you're doing the thing that no matter whether you get paid or not, you're doing it right. And I think that works out very well for agents. See, I thought when I asked you that question, you were going to say, well, someone had, has sold another big ticket item like a car or a boat mm-hmm. would be good at real estate. But that's not the case no, all I, the time, I, is I, it? No, I really don't think that those it, – it, it's very interesting. Um, my experience with real estate agents is that the really terribly successful agents come out of uh, come out of places you wouldn't normally expect. Um, sometimes they're really good salespeople. I, I know a really, really top-notch salesperson who, who used to sell uh, water filters. Mm-hmm. I mean, not a big ticket item. No, yeah, not a big ticket item, and uh, just water filtration. Like, I'm not, I'm not talking thousands of dollar water filtration systems for municipalities. I'm talking about just a, an in-home water filter. <laughs> okay. You know, you know, so uh, you know, working for something like a Roaring Spring bottling or something like that. Uh, so, you know, I um, a, another very successful agent in another market used to work the uh, work work the uh, rental counter at a resort. You know, like a ski resort. Mm-hmm. Uh, you know, again, it's customer service. People that have got a real uh, knack for customer service that really like to help people do very, very well in real estate. Okay. People, people. People, people. Exactly. Yeah. So it's interesting. If you know, if you, you sold big ticket items, there's not a guarantee. I mean, if you sold big ticket items, you may have a real good people personality and that might work really well. But, um, you know, even maybe extremely technical people, I'm not going to say, I mean, I'm trying to think we do have some engineer type people that work in the business. But I think the folks that, that can explain, you know, take maybe a, a, a difficult concept and explain it, be patient, uh, be helpful. Um, and, and be very organized. That's where teachers come in. I, I got a guy who's a teacher. He came in not long after he became an agent, and he had a color-coded folder for everything. You know, he was super, super organized, even though we really don't work on paper a lot, Paul. And, and that really impressed me because his organizational skills really equated to him being able to help, help people the best. 
Or help a lot of people at one time, maybe. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Up to the limit. You know, one of the things we always talk about our part-time people is that they're a lot of them are terribly successful because they take on just what they can handle, and they're very selective about what they spend their time on because they've got uh, just a narrow slice of time that they're going to spend, and they're very selective about what they'll work on. Newsman Ted Koppel. Remember mm. Ted did Nightline for years? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, he was up in the Deep Creek Lake area for a while. He did had, owned a vacation property up there. Well, mm. Ted, someone came up to Ted once and said, Hey, Ted, my son wants to be a journalist. Mm. Where should he go to school? And Ted said, Don't go to a journalism school. He goes, Become a marine biologist and become mm. a good marine biologist and then take those skills to journalism. Wow, there you go. So, you know, it, it, that has always stuck with me mm. as, a, as a thought process that, you know, you don't necessarily have to be uh, someone who went to college with the idea of becoming a realtor right. or never even went to college, really. Right. Mm-hmm. If you have the right attitude that you want to help people, you're going to find the answers that you need for them. You could be a marine biologist to be a good real estate agent, too, depending right. on your approach. Yeah, so, so uh, one of the things uh, I've often said in real estate is I can teach you to be a real estate agent. I can't teach you to be nice. Uh, you know, so uh, we hire for aptitude. We can teach you the mechanical pieces. But if you're really not a nice person and you really don't like working with people or you really look at things transactionally, you're miserable. Yeah, you, you know, it, you're just you're just not gonna, you're, you're, and you're not gonna enjoy real estate. I mean, it's it's not gonna be the good thing for you because every time you turn the, you know, you, you turn the ignition on in your car, you say, well, what am I getting paid for doing this? And and that's just not the mentality. You you do it because it's the right thing to do, the helpful thing to do, not because you're getting paid to do it. Do you stop people in midstream? They've taken their getting license. They've got their license. Mm-hmm. And then they come and they start to work in the business and you say, hey, wait a second. This is not going to work for you. I know that you put in your 60 to 90 hours, Mm -hmm. but this is not for you. Yeah, we've actually had that conversation. Uh, I've had that conversation with a number of agents, actually. And and it's usually, uh, you really don't know for sure until they get their license. I don't know for sure until they get their license and they start doing some transactions. Then I'll have a much better sense of their interpersonal relationships. Um, and, and things always percolate. Like if I have, I'll get calls uh, on agents, you know, the client will call. I, you know, saying, hey, I did not have a good, you know, tr- transaction with them. Uh, or the, the other piece is the agents that are very transactional tend to not do follow-up very well, meaning they won't call their client frequently. They won't give them updates because that's just, they don't see that as I'm getting paid for that. And so what will happen is it, it's, it's sometimes difficult to spot because some people can, you, on the surface, you can tell, I can tell you right now, Paul, I, I'm a terrible judge in the outset because when you, people appear to do everything right and everything's looking great, it's not until you actually get into the, you know, into the, into the meat of the, or kind of into the heat of the battle where they say everybody, uh, Everybody, any military plan until until battle tested looks great, right? Mm-hmm. You don't know what the opponent's going to do, and and a lot of times in real estate you don't know until they actually start a couple of transactions how they're going to behave in those transactions and whether they're going to be really good at that. In on the opposite end of the miserability index mm-hmm. would be it's somebody that really can't deliver bad news or less than good news. Can't make that call unless they have something good to say. Right. And, and you have to do that sometimes. Yeah, absolutely. As a broker, you know, because we have a, uh, service levels we want to maintain and uh, customer service levels. So, yeah, I have, I have to be that guy and, and, and be the one. But on the flip side of the people that don't have the aptitude is the ones that come out of nowhere and just, I mean, sometimes uh, I, I am stunned by where some of the success comes from. And I can tell you that busy people that, that can juggle a lot of different things at once seem to be really good at real estate. Uh, it seems like if, you know, you take, well, they always say, if you want to get something done, give it to a busy person. Uh, but people that can manage a lot uh, of things at once tend to be very good at real estate because real estate is, and this will surprise you a little bit, but real estate isn't really sales. It's really not sales. It's, okay. it's project management. Okay. Which which blows a lot. A lot of people don't think of it that way, but it, the real estate is getting the client from contract to closing and making it successful, right? It's it, it, there's not a lot of salesmanship in real estate. 
there's some negotiating, but the notion of selling somebody a home these days, the, the client is really choosing. They're not being sold. And they like to choose. Nobody mm -hmm. likes to be sold to, right? right? They like to be the selector or the chooser. And so today, and, and maybe this is late in the conversation to be saying this, but uh, real estate isn't sales, in my opinion. It, it is really project management. It's getting the job completed and making sure that nothing gets missed. I was going to bottom line this and say, you're looking for an organized people person. <laughs> you nailed it. Yeah. Okay. That, yeah. <laughs> and so, and so uh, a project manager is somebody that's going to have to work with resources and with people to get the job done. And uh, I taught project management at Penn State for probably 10 years. Okay. And so I'm, I'm, I'm actually in a position to be an authority on being able to say that I think that this is a project management, which is one of the reasons that I jumped into real estate later in my career, because I spotted real estate as something that nobody really got that is really truly project management. And very few people work it that way. And so we do. And mainly if you look at it as several different projects that you have. Exactly. At different states of germination. Right then you're going to be okay. It's, it's incredible that when you, when you step back and you look at it and you define it as project management, then everything falls into place because then it's about the processes that you have, the organization. So I said that this guy was terribly organized. It's the organization, it's the processes, it's the, it's the resources, you know, the vendors that help you get the job done. It's the organization and the scheduling to make sure everything lands where it should. Um, it's truly a project management task with, like you said, it's a customer service play. You gotta have somebody who's very good at communicating and working with the client. What if the client is a miserable person? <laughs> Now you know you have to you have to still go through the process, but that can be that can be tough. Yeah, there are some people who are going to appear to never be happy, um, right. and and that's part and, of and not just looking for the best deal, but mm -hmm. just basically, no matter what you do, you're not going to be able to please them. And and, and here's what I tell agents right up front, um, and and this will sound a little bit heavy handed, but. I think when I tell agents, say, look, if you are not in control of the process, if you don't get control early on of the process and make this your process that you lead the client through, you're not going to get through. If the client's going to fight you all the way through it and is going to be miserable, you're going to have a miserable outcome, mm -hmm. right? Or maybe no out or, or no sale. It's not going to happen. So um, I will often, and, and part of that can be pricing, you know, right up front. Like I, I, I have been working with some clients. I've been trying to price a property and get it listed for a couple of weeks now, and they they don't see it my way. They want more for the property, and if I don't get control of that process, we will not have a positive outcome, Paul. No, that's true. We won't. It doesn't matter. I. We're really good at what we do, but it's tough. We don't. We're not genies. We can't grant wishes like that. <laughs> but 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 you need a, a, a staff of agents that can recover from that. Yeah, absolutely. Right. You know, some of it that's not going to carry that. Um, maybe for the rest of the week they're okay, but at the next week it's a new week. We got to move on. Well, and and one of the things that, and this is a side benefit of the way our telephone systems work and our processes work, is that. You know, you walk into a Perry Wellington office that has, like, we have an office that has 50 agents based out of it. You're unlikely to find more than two or three agents in that office at any typical time. Sometimes you'll, there'll be seven or eight or ten, but on a given day, you might only run into two or three. Because one of the things we're not trying to, we're not trying to, part of uh, the, the uh, side we would call it not side benefit, but one of the uh, after effects of this type of uh, 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 emotional overflow is that it can bleed into agents and agents will bleed into other agents. It, it'll actually rub off onto other agents. So having everybody hang around, having all 50 agents around the water cooler spinning each other up is not a good thing. Mm -hmm. And so as a side benefit of the way our, our processes work, we don't have everybody hyping, you know, getting everybody all wound up over these types of things, which is kind of good. Do you have anybody on your staff that you have as kind of a, a, a specialist uh, as far as for certain types of individuals that are selling property. I said the, the, the quote, miserable person. I don't know if you have one of those, but do you have different personality types that you try to match up sometimes? A, a little bit. And sometimes uh, sometimes we'll swap them out, you know, or we'll, we'll have an agent go on a listing appointment and say, look, I just, I need somebody that's a little bit, that's going to be able to manage this type of person a little better. That doesn't happen that frequently. It really happens more along the property lines. Like this is a farm versus this is vacant land this, versus this is a residential over half a million dollar property or something like that. Okay. Well, you know, so if you're thinking about becoming a real estate agent, 
you have to do a number of different things. You got to get the get the sheepskin. Yes. And then you also have to learn the craft. And, and that's a lot. I mean, learning the craft part is the part that's going to take you a long time. Yeah. And uh, agents, interestingly, agents make, uh, according to NAR, National Association of Realtors, make the most money in their 16th year of being an agent. How about that for you? I was a reaction, wow. Paul. You, had a, you didn't hear that on the radio, but Paul had just had a raised eyebrow I'm moment. Like, hmm. Yeah, 16th year yeah. is the statistic. So you're not going to do well... Or you're not going to do your best coming right out of the box. Although, although there are, I, I think that's going to be challenged in the future. Uh, you're going to see that, I think, happen much more quickly in the future. Uh, but that's the statistic as it stands today. What, what about technology? You're a big tech guy. Mm-hmm. Uh, that's why I think that's going to get challenged in the future. Yeah, I, yeah. The, the technology piece is absolutely going to le- be, give leverage to agents.